Welcome back to Module 4. In this video, we're going to finish our coverage of Chapter 15 from OpenStax Astronomy. We're, we're going to be discussing how the Sun affects the Earth. Now, I want to make sure we understand what we, what we mean by affecting the Earth. The sun is always affecting the Earth. We have daytime because of the light it sends us. We have warmth and we're not freezing like the rest of space because of the heat it sends us. But there are additional effects, often referred to as space weather, uh, that the sun's magnetic field and active regions can create events that directly affect the Earth and most commonly affect our technologies. And there are times, there are periods of time where this is more likely to happen, so more space weather events, and that's called solar maximum, and times where there's less likely to have events, and that's solar minimum. Now, we've been tracking this for quite a while as a human race, and one of the things that we have been able to track for centuries, uh, many centuries at this point, is the number of sunspots. So astronomers, both professional and amateur, have been tracking the number of visible sunspots in the photosphere um, from one day to the next for centuries. So the telescope was uh, invented in the 1600s, and astronomers, both uh, those that would call themselves professional scholars, as well as noble people who had a telescope because it was the new cool thing, um, they could keep track of sunspots and share them with others. And what we have found by looking over this data is that when there are more sunspots present, there is also more solar activity. And one of the things we want to remember from the previous video is that sunspots in the photosphere correspond with active regions in the solar corona. So when we have a lot of sunspots, it means we also have a lot of active regions. So if we look at this pair of data sets, so this is one of the recent completed solar cycles, we see that on the left we are looking at images of the um, solar chromosphere, from 1996 to 2006. And in the first couple of years of the data set in the last couple of years, there are very few bright regions, very few active regions being shown. And in the front three, 2000, 2001, and 2002, there are more of these bright regions, kind of bands of activity. Uh, and when we look at the number of sunspots from one year to the next on the right side of the screen, we see that the first couple of uh, years, especially, very few sunspots. Uh, there's a year uh, which looks like it might have been zero sunspots uh, on average. Uh, and then in 2000 and 2002, there were peaks. There was kind of a double peak. This isn't a perfect, smooth uh, data set. But it does show us that there's some activity that's more common and some that's less common. When we look at a more recent set of completed solar cycles, we can see this trend continuing. And when we look closely, we'll note that uh, we're in uh, solar cycle 25, at least while I'm making this video, uh, and we don't yet know uh, when it's going to have its peak or what the data will look like when it is at its peak. But I do want us to recognize that although this does affect our um, technologies, this solar cycle is not a cause of long-term weather effects on Earth. Um, this is more having to do with how our satellites interact with uh, particles from space rather than any other larger effect, although we will talk about a particular event that happened in the past. If we look closely at the data set, we can see that it seems like it's about uh, every 10 years. It's in fact 11 years when we look at it closely and kind of average over all of these different cycles, some of which have these double peaks, some of which don't, some of which are higher than others, but it's an 11 year cycle and you're welcome to explore the data on your own as well. Um, the link is in the posted slides. When we look not only at how many sunspots we have, but also where those sunspots are appearing, we also get something called the butterfly diagram. So butterfly on its side. Uh, and we see that although when we're just looking at the total counts, it looks like the count goes up and then it goes back down again. It goes up and goes back down again. 
that actually loses out on an additional piece of information, which is that sunspots start out at the beginning of a cycle pretty far from the solar equator. And those sunspots and active regions kind of migrate towards the center of the sun's rotation over time. And then there's this rapid reset where they were getting really close to each other near the equator, and then it's almost like it snaps and resets to be back farther away from the equator again. So that gives us some clues as to what's happening, things that we can then start to put together with physics ideas, physics hypotheses. So sunspot groups can be tracked. Galileo did this in the 1600s. We can not only watch them evolve over time, if you look at the set of data from uh, about a week's worth of time, the sunspots move around a little bit. There is this kind of constant motion that we can see, but they also show us how quickly they're moving across the surface. When we watch this and we are careful to look at how long that takes, what we find out as as scientists, as astronomers, is that sunspots actually move a lot faster near the equator of the sun than they do farther away. The sun's equator rotates at a faster rate than the poles. Now I want us to stop and think about that for just a moment. When we think about the Earth, the entire solid sphere of the Earth rotates on its axis once every 24 hours. That's true if you're standing two feet away from the North Pole. That's true if you're standing on a mountain on the equator. You'll get back to where you started in 24 hours because that's one solid thing rotating. But when we look at these sunspots, what we find out is that the sun is not a rigid body rotator. It is not acting like it's a solid that all rotates at the same time. The equator is much faster by several days um, worth of difference than the rotation at the poles. And so once we add that piece of information to a piece of information that astronomers already knew about, that the sun has these magnetic fields we start to get a sense of what's happening. The sun has pretty organized magnetic fields at the start of a solar cycle. The magnetic fields are kind of like a bar magnet if you've ever seen a demonstration in a science class in middle school or high school or, um, or college even. And they are parallel to each other. But because the equator is moving much faster, they get wrapped up. So now Maybe let's imagine that we've got a tennis ball with a whole bunch of rubber bands around it, but we're pulling the rubber bands um, tighter around the middle of the tennis ball. And at some point, as we pull those rubber bands and pull those rubber bands, I want you to think about what would happen if we continued to pull a rubber band. At some point, it would snap. And that's what is happening with the sun's magnetic field lines, too. At some point, they are so messed up, they're so chaotic, that they snap and re rearrange themselves. This snapping is called magnetic reconnection. It is a real thing. Maybe not identical to a rubber band snapping, but still the same end result, that we had one set of field lines and how they link to each other. And there's kind of an almost instant reset where they are pointing then in a different direction. And when they reset at the end of 11 years, instead of going from south to north, they'd be going from north to south. So some astronomers want to emphasize the fact that the solar cycle is really a 22-year cycle because that is relevant to the way that the magnetic field interacts with, for example, Earth's magnetic field. But this period of um, maximum and minimum, that repeats every 11 years. And so every two of those, we get back to where we truly actually started. All right, so what does that mean for Earth? This is a um, just kind of artist representation of the fact that the sun and the earth have important connections that we need to study. It is not trying to be to scale. It is not trying to indicate anything in colors that our eyes would necessarily see. But it is suggesting the fact that the sun sends us material. It sends us light and heat, but it also sends us particles. And we have a term that we want to use to describe all of the ways that the sun affects the earth directly, and that's space weather, as I mentioned before. There are three main types of phenomena that we want to understand, and we want to make sure that we feel confident with each of them. So solar flares, 
if we think about if we've ever seen, um, maybe not real life, but in a movie, an emergency flare, it's light. Solar flares are bright bursts of light, high energy photons, usually x-rays, um, that get sent off separate from the normal light that the sun is sending. So an additional kind of flash of bright, high energy photons. That would be a solar flare. Coronal mass ejections, that's mass, material, ejected from the corona. So it is a physical blob of um, plasma that is sent out away from the sun. And it's one specific blob of plasma that goes in one specific direction. So there's a lot of directions that don't head towards Earth, but sometimes those coronal mass ejections either are big enough or they spread out that we get some of them or they are aimed in our direction. So coronal mass ejections is physical plasma that is getting sent out uh, in one direction. And then the solar wind is an interesting thing. We uh, have briefly heard that term two different times in our slides so far, and we don't, might not remember, and that's not a big deal. But when we first introduced the Earth's magnetic field, we mentioned that it protects us from this constant outflow called the solar wind. And then when we learned about comets, we learned that their tails point away from the sun because of this outflow of charged particles called the solar wind. So the solar wind is always being sent out in all directions away from the sun, and it is sometimes kind of gusty in the same way that there might always be a general breeze um, in, our, in our environment, but sometimes the winds blow really strong. So space weather, strong solar wind or fast solar wind is also a, um, a key event for that too. Now, flares and coronal mass ejections, we feel very confident uh, in astronomy, originate in active regions. So we talked about how when we look at sunspots, so that's example A here, sunspot groups, when seen in the photosphere, correspond with the active regions shown in B, where we actually see an ongoing so uh, solar flare where the pixels are kind of like so... Um, saturated that they're creating this weird artifacting. And then C and D are showing snapshots of a loop of material, coronal mass ejection, moving farther and farther away from the sun. And I encourage you to watch the um, video clip in the link here from the, the posted slides. So those two events are very specific transient events in time. That means that they will happen and then they'll be gone. We don't have the current abilities in our science understanding to predict solar flares or coronal mass ejections, but we can pay attention to really big active regions and know which ones seem likely to cause these events and which ones seem like they aren't quite there yet. And then the fastest solar wind that we have, the the buffeting that comes from uh, these kind of faster uh, wind gusts comes from coronal holes. We mentioned those before in the previous video. Coronal holes look dark because there's not material trapped there. So they look dark because the plasma is able to escape freely outflowing from the sun and is not trapped in the corona. So that fast moving plasma leaving the sun creates the fast solar wind. Now, when that solar wind gets to Earth, it can create really beautiful aurora. So if we've ever seen for ourselves the northern lights or aurora, this kind of greenish glow usually we can see from the ground. Uh, from space, it's a lot easier to see the redder um, types of aurora that can happen higher up in the atmosphere. What we are seeing is electrons from the sun hitting and kind of vibrating molecules in Earth's atmosphere. And as those molecules settle back down into a lower energy state, they release um, photons as a glow that we can see. And we see these ribbons because we are watching all of these electrons, many, many of them, coming down following the same set of field lines, and they're hitting the atmosphere in that uh, kind of ribbon pattern as all of that magnetic field lines heads back towards the Earth itself. So the aurora is really neat, but it is important for us to recognize that space weather itself can affect lots of technologies. 
So as a brief example for us as we wrap up this section, we're going to talk a little bit about the 1859 Carrington event. And there's information in the textbook if you want more or just a deeper overall um, history of it. But the Carrington event was a specific space weather event in 1859 that began um, when Richard Carrington, who was one of these um, amateur astronomers that was constantly recording uh, the sunspots, the data that we use for the butterfly diagrams for the sunspots. We can see from this sketch that he is paying attention to where these sunspots are. We can see the 20 degrees, zero degrees to indicate the location on the sun. He noted in one of his normal daily sketches some bright flashes that he saw, and he labels them in the sketch A, B, C, and D. Small bright flashes and visible light. If his eyes are seeing them, then it is a flash in visible light. And already with the modern understanding that astronomers have, that is an indication that that was a solar flare that was so intense and so bright that rather than a small peak in ultraviolet or x-ray, there were so many photons that the kind of distribution of energies extended all the way into visible light. So he noted that, he thought it was kind of weird. And if that was all that happened, we probably wouldn't really be talking about it uh, in the, the modern era. But what happened was the following couple of days, it took two or three, four days um, for other effects to be seen. And all of a sudden, because it takes a while, instead of moving at the speed of light, coronal mass ejections have to move with the plasma speed. It takes them several days to get from the sun to the earth. Along with this set of flares, a huge coronal mass ejection, bigger than any that we have seen in modern times, was sent out headed almost perfectly straight targeted towards Earth. So there's already a lot of things that makes this unlikely and they just kind of all lined up together. And when that coronal mass ejection finally reached Earth, all of those electrons interacting with Earth's magnetic field changed the magnetic field on a global scale. And one of the key things in physics is when you have a changing magnetic field, you create electric fields, which meant that any long metal thing all of a sudden had electricity running through it. So we're talking 1859, we're talking about telegraph lines, for example. They um, were overloaded with electricity. There were several fires um, that happened in telegraph stations, and um, they became unusable for several days. And as this kind of process um, calmed itself down, once things were um, kind of broken for a while, there was then a period of time where there was so much residual electricity that they would run by themselves without being kind of fully connected to everything else. So that was, that was intense for the time, but when we think about how much technology we re re rely on these days, we would have these overloading electricity um, things for our power grid, and you can't easily take transformers offline without affecting a lot of people, so we would have to know with enough uh, notice and enough confidence to say, you know what, we need to take these key parts of our power grid offline, otherwise they will get overloaded. Um, airplanes would have to be grounded because they wouldn't be able to navigate properly in the air. We could have um, satellite issues where satellites could be permanently damaged or partially um, out of service. And even oil pipelines. Oil pipelines currently have, um, have to be careful about space weather as a whole, uh, degrading the metal. And an event like that would also have an effect on those long metal pipes as well. So there's things that make the sun dangerous, but there are plenty of people keeping track of all of this. The Space Weather Prediction Center, so SWPC, um, SWPC, uh, is part of the same body of uh, our government that the National Weather Service is part of. And so there are people who are constantly monitoring what the sun is doing, 
And when it sends a coronal mass ejection, they can, once they see it, they can model it very well to know when it's going to arrive, is it going to be aimed at Earth, away from Earth, and there's a lot of planning and um, awareness. And so we, we can predict um, what will happen once the event occurs at the sun, uh, but we are not at the scientific understanding to be able to say, hey, in 10 days, there's going to be a coronal mass ejection. We don't have that knowledge yet. So if you have questions about how space weather affects us in our everyday lives or you're curious to learn more, definitely check, with, check in with me. And um, this is near and dear to my uh, dissertation work, so I would always love to talk about it a lot more than our curriculum needs. So until the next video, thanks for watching.